emphasis uh, in working with Mark uh, throughout New England, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island in particular, we offer you this collaborative uh, webinar uh, to discuss community health by design. At the moment, we feel like through the current landscape, through the Affordable Care Act, through accreditation purposes at the state and local level, there are plenty of opportunities for folks in the community to be looking at uh, the built environment process. We're pleased to have Mark, an expert in the field, as, who is seen as a national public health planning and transportation consultant and a professor at Tufts University, present with us today on his experiences in the built environment. Mark will present his information and then we'll open up the lines for, uh, for question and answer. So Mark, please feel free to start your presentation. Thanks, Steve. It's, it's great to be with you, and, and thanks so much for those of you who have signed up. In particular, I saw a, a bunch of familiar names, so uh, thank you uh, if you've uh, worked with us before in the past, and I promise that there's going to be some new information today because effectively, effectively what we're going to do is share some of our experience in doing the kinds of workshops that maybe some of you have even hosted with us um, because we're beginning to get a sense that there are some uh, very practical lessons that we think are, are worthy of replication uh, for communities out there that are they're embarking on the path of healthy community design. This is the hot topic now. Lots of communities are either getting state or federal funding, so programs like Mass in Motion, or if you were to go out to Minnesota, the Minnesota Blue Cross Blue Shield has supported this kind of work. The YMCA of the USA has. It's, it's really interesting, the range, and of course, a lot of CDC-funded communities around the country. Um, but it could be your local foundation, a hospital, a healthcare organization that stepped up to the plate and say, you know, we've really got to start doing prevention around uh, some of the leading risk factors. Um, and the result, um, we're gonna, I'm going to really touch on four things here. Uh, a little bit of perspective, and if you've heard from me before, the first two bullets here might be familiar. Uh, I guarantee you the last two will not. The, uh, the first is a little bit of perspective on what we've been doing and, and uh, the fact that we're realizing as a, as a movement in public health that it's not working. Second, a, a quick look at the evidence regarding what we really mean when we talk about healthy communities by design. You know, there's really a growing and solid body of evidence. Let's make sure we, we review that really quickly. And then let's cut to the chase, uh, because I really think the beef, the thing that uh, HRIA and I have discovered working together, is the importance of uh, the community-level interdisciplinary coalitions, the coalitions that cross sectors, not just the, the usual suspects from health and health promotion, health care, um, but uh, outside disciplines, economic development, planning, public works, trails advocates, schools, um, food service providers, that when you get to that broader coalition is when you really get to the kind of change that makes a difference in a community. And, and uh, one of my experiences is that even if you get a great coalition like that set up, frequently they need a little bit of a jump start, that um, to bring that varied group together, you almost need an outside voice to come in and give it a little poke. And I'm seeing around the country that happens lots of different ways, but that little poke or what I call a jump start uh, can really make a difference. So those are the things I want to talk about. You'll notice the photo on the right actually is from one of the workshops that we did together um, uh, called... Um, uh, uh, well, it was down in, I think, South Kingston, Rhode Island, and notably, we're walking on a road that is called Devil's Foot Road, which was totally appropriate given how we felt like we were taking our lives into our hands. You can see the, the heavy truck traffic right there. And, you know, one of our points is that getting out in the field and making a field assessment really makes a difference. You can look at a map and see that there's a wide shoulder on that road and say, well, that would be a safe road to ride a bicycle or to walk on. But you get out there and walk, man, it's a different thing entirely. So uh, I think a really relevant lesson to our work. Um, I'm going to ask you to join me in a little mental exercise to open. I said we'd open with a little bit of perspective. Some of you have done this with me before, so please indulge me. Um, I want you to think back for a moment to your earliest fond recollection of being physically active as a youngster. And what I mean by that is think back to when you were a really little kid, not high school sports, not being on a team, little kids like the ones in these photos. And I want you to think, and what did you do for fun? What, what do you remember being physically active? You know, was it a uh, formal structured team that you had to sign up for and go to, or was it that kind of informal play? Uh, kids just taking off on a Saturday morning on their bicycles, uh, walking to school but playing in the creek along the way like the kids in the top left picture there, um, making up your own games in the backyard or going to the neighborhood um, empty lot. And, and I'm going to ask you a specific question, and I think there's a mechanism whereby you can respond to this. So we're going to ask you, do you feel like you were a free-range kid? 
Uh, and I, this is a sincere question. You know, if you could let me use the term free range in application to a child, I think you'd say a lot of us um, could perceive what that means. So were you one? And, and what we're hoping is you can respond now uh, to that question. Um, yes or no? Simple yes or no. Yep, I was a free range kid. Or no, I felt like most of my physical activity was kind of structured and organized, scheduled time and a place. I was only with kids. All right, so <laughs> only with kids the same age, same gender. What we're seeing, quick answer to that is a, about a, a 95 to 5 ratio. About 95% of you are saying, yeah, I was a free range kid. Um, and indeed, if I have a room full of people of a certain age, and I'm not saying you're old, listeners, I'm just saying uh, anybody over about age 30 remembers having been pretty free range as a kid. The reality is, however, uh, when we look at kids' behavior now, we've got some pretty compelling evidence that, that, that it's not so much the case. In fact, if I ask people, do you think the majority of kids today are free range? The answer is no. And I then ask, do you think it's good for their health? And everybody agrees it can't be. It can't be good that kids spend more time in front of screens, less time outdoors. In fact, Richard Louv, uh, his book here on the right, Last Child in the Woods, decries a, a, a condition he calls nature deficit disorder that really captures the physiological and even developmental issues associated with kids not getting out, outside and playing, um, the lack of inventiveness and creativity and making up your own games and so on. So, uh, <coughs> pardon me, it's really striking, and yet, when we ask parents, why don't you let kids walk and bike to school anymore? Why can't you let your kid disappear on a Saturday morning with his friends? Um, parents will instantly say, well, it's not safe. In fact, the special issue of Time Magazine really delved into that, delved into that very deeply. And, and the interesting point about that is, if I ask folks, you know, what do you think the change in safety is? How much less safe is it now than 30 or 40 years ago? How much more violent crime against kids? by people who don't know them, do you think there is now versus, say, back in 1970 when almost 40% of kids walked and biked to school and only about 15% actually rode in the car, as opposed to now where more like 50% of kids walk and bike to school and only about 10 or 15% actually. Um, I mean, 50% are driven by car and only about 15% walk or bike. So that's a dramatic reversal in only about 30 or 40 years. And notably, that is the same identical 30 years in which childhood obesity rates tripled. And there's no one that's going to convince me that that's a coincidence. As we got in the habit of throwing the kids into the backseat of the car for absolutely everything, a ride to a friend's house, going to school, going to an after-school program, as that became more pervasive, so did rising rates of childhood obesity and indeed type 2 diabetes and a host of related afflictions. Interestingly, over that precise time period, there's no evidence that there was a dramatic increase in violent crime against children by people who don't know them. In other words, kids, what's different is how the media covers it, the fact that there can be an Amber Alert in California, and we hear about it in New York. Um, but the reality is many of the things that's changed are things like roads are wider, traffic is faster, motor vehicles are larger, so the built environment is a scarier space. And that means that even if you do live in a neighborhood, and let's recognize there are places where it is not safe for a child to be out and alone. Um, you know, you might say, Mark, hey, look, I'm in an urban environment where there's gang activity, and I'd rather have my child be indoors and sedentary than out risking being shot. I get that. Um, but then our answer has to be to fix it. Um, we have to begin to recreate a world where kids can be free range, not simply accept that destiny for them. Because what we've been doing so far regarding child and adult health in this country has simply not been working. What we've done some, so far isn't doing the job. And, and I want to just talk about recalibrating that conversation. In part, it's I think by even talking about it differently. For starters, everybody talks about the obesity epidemic shows this kind of data, rising rates of, of body mass index, the percentage of adult population, um, or, or images like the one on the front of that Time magazine, which I almost think belittle or make light of, of, of increasing ill health in this country. And I think a good starting point would be to change the conversation to recognize the, really the underlying behaviors that those of us that work in public health need to be thinking about. And those are, of course, physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Combined with a third unhealthy behavior, tobacco use, I've had hospital administrators tell me they feel that these three things are filling some 60 to 70, maybe even 80 or 90 percent of their hospital beds. Diseases associated with tobacco use, physical inactivity, poor nutrition. It's sort of mind-boggling when you think about the fact that these are the things driving up health care costs in our country. So furthermore, and this is very important, let's recognize that these are independent risk factors, that even if a person doesn't dramatically lose weight, if we can help them be more physically active, if they can improve nutrition, they will live a longer, healthier life. Their risk profile will improve. That's important because weight 
is very intransigent. It's hard to change, but we can help people be more active and eat better. Um, having said that, I've encapsulated the physical activity part of this conundrum with three numbers, basically, 30, 20, 365. 30 being the minutes per day we're told every American adult should be physically active through the Health and Human Services and National Guidelines. That's just a half an hour a day. It seems very attainable. Unfortunately, only 20% of American adults actually meet these recommendations through what we call leisure time physical activity, or LTPA. Similar numbers for kids, apparently, as we start to look at that data more closely. Maybe one in five meet the daily recommendation. And the 365, you would hope, would be days of the year that we're physically active. Unfortunately, it's the num number of annual deaths, premature deaths, due to physical inactivity and poor nutrition. To be very clear, that's second only to tobacco. Tobacco probably kills 400,000 Americans every year. Inactivity and poor nutrition are the so-called obesity epidemic, 365,000. And here's the really scary part. We know that tobacco deaths appear to be plateauing and maybe even beginning to drop, finally, while inactivity and poor nutrition deaths are still on the rise. Um, I want to reiterate that these guidelines make very clear that that 30 minutes per day for adults, or more like an hour a day for kids, um, is, is, does not have to be formal structured exercise. That there's compelling evidence that it can be sort of the physical activity we accumulate in the, during the day. So the people that we see walking here in Kingstown, Rhode Island, sort of doing errands on the street, if they walk for a half an hour to do those errands, they gain the benefit of reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, a growing list of cancers. For example, we know women who are physically active, not only at lower risk for breast cancer, but even among women diagnosed with breast cancer, we know those who are physically active have a higher survival rate. So every time we get another study about the, the beneficial effects of physical activity and good nutrition, it reiterates um, how powerful this is. Unfortunately, here's that 20 number, the 20% that actually get the physical activity that is recommended, the yellow line here showing those who are sufficiently active. And what's striking about it is that, A, this is probably an overestimate because it's based on telephone survey data in which we know people tend to tell us what, they want, what we want to hear. So they tend to exercise more and also be taller and weigh less when they're on the phone than when you measure it in real life. The other thing is that it's dead flat. So for, although we've been talking about this for 20 or 30 years, we've made no real progress in increasing the percentage of American adults who actually get the recommended daily physical activity. And if people ask me why, and you've probably heard me say this before, if you've heard me ever speak on the topic, I call it the stickiness problem. And it's well illustrated by this graphic. This is just a simple graph. You don't even have to know the details other than it's a graph of exercise minutes per week over a period of 18 months for three groups that were in a walking program. They were, they were being encouraged to walk, and they did all the things that we normally do in these programs, give them email reminders and telephone calls. And if you turned in your exercise diary, you got a prize like a T-shirt or a water bottle, because that's what we do in health promotion. We give out T-shirts and water bottles and fanny packs and baseball hats. Um, and, and, and it's all great because, as you see over the first six months of the study, all three groups in the study increased their exercise minutes per week. Unfortunately, and here's the bad news, um, after people were left to their own devices, the intervention was removed after six months and they were left to their own devices, even despite the fact that they had been losing weight and were gaining aerobic fitness, so aer objectively measured their aerobic fitness increased. Despite all that, what you see is that over time, their behavior regressed back to the initial condition and even worse. The researchers suggest that's probably because they had volunteered for the study all excited and then Life came in and intervened, you know, all the normal things of life. So this is what I call the stickiness problem. By the way, quick side note here, I can show you the same graphic for things like speed intervention studies where we send a, a police officer with a radar gun to a neighborhood to try to slow traffic. You can see the traffic drop off for as long as the officer is there doing the intervention because we're educating, we're encouraging, in that case we're enforcing. As soon as the cop leaves, the speeds begin to climb back up. This is what I call the stickiness problem, and it drives, I think, the, pro the, the underlying difficulty in, in changing behavior. And that leads us to this, what we call a socio-ecological approach to behavior change. Effectively, across the boards in public health, when we've been successful, we've done something more than just tell people what to do, more than just education and encouragement. We actually operate on multiple levels of this social ecology model and have all of the cues encouraging the person or the, the community, if you will, to uh, uh, take up the, the healthier behavior. Um, so it's not just uh, your individual motivation, but it's family and friends cueing you the same way, your workplace, your healthcare provider, the school, the community by its physical design, and even public policies. And when I ask people, well, give me an example, um, even people who've never done anything in public health get the answer. They say, 
Well, tobacco, right? I mean, we don't just tell people not to smoke anymore. We make it hard to smoke in public places. We've taxed the daylights out of the products. There's a warning label on the side that says, this will kill you. Can't smoke on an airplane. I mean, what more could we do? We've taken the advertising off of television. We've really changed social norms. And that lesson is really salient because we've seen an actual reduction in per capita cigarette deaths, but that only happened when we engaged in the policy level. Not when we just, when we told people cigarettes would kill them, but we engaged in policy level change. Regarding physical activity then, what might be an example? Well, what it means is it's not enough to build a fitness center in every workplace to put a treadmill in every house. Um, we've actually got to build communities where by their very intrinsic design, people are more physically active as a part of daily life. And the correlate to that would be, we don't want to get people on diets what we want to do is build environments where healthy food choices are accessible and affordable to everybody of every income level in the community. Only when we operate at that level, making physical activity and, uh, and healthy nutrition so convenient and accessible, uh, only when we get to that level will we see, I think, population level improvements. Now, you should be asking, okay, smarty pants, fast talking guy, you seem to make the case here that we can build an environment where people would be more physically active. Is there any evidence that that actually occurs? And the short answer is yes. Uh, these four elements I draw from the research literature summarizing basically the four things that characterize settings where people tend to be more active as a part of daily life. Where, for example, they're getting more walking and bicycling just for routine tasks, walking to school, riding a bike to the corner store, or walking to a transit stop. It's a greater mix of different kinds of destinations within proximity good connecting facilities between them, things like sidewalks and bike lanes and trails and pathways. The destinations themselves are designed in a way to reward you rather than punishing you for showing up without a car. And last but not least, it's, success. it's really safe and accessible for everybody in the community. Now, this is really important. It means every age, every income level, not just the wealthy have access to a nice bike trail. Everybody in the community has got a safe place to walk and all abilities and disabilities. So we've designed it in a universally accessible way. And, and I can illustrate, um, I'll go back to Kingstown, which I showed you the slide of earlier, where we did some workshops around this. And, and so the photos are from here, but essentially what we're talking about with regard to that first category, it's, it's a mix of land uses. That's what a planner would say, where, where you have where you live and work and shop and play and learn and pray in close proximity. And, and keep this in mind. I'm showing uh, images of a smallish suburban town in Rhode Island. We worked with the Rhode Island Department of Health on these workshops and they were really great. But, but I want to say, it's equally relevant for the most urban environment. I could show you photos from urban Chicago, LA, or New York, and I could show you from rural Iowa where I've worked, um, examples of these sorts of things, of the town square that's got the church and the school and the playground and the green park um, um, all in proximity, or the urban environment that's got all of those on one city block. Um, so, so that's element one, a mix of land uses. The ne next element is, is the network connecting those land uses. So we need sidewalks, we need bike lanes, we need multi-use trails and transit. And this is very important. I mentioned transit because there is a growing body of evidence that regular transit riders get more physical activity, that the act of taking transit is, is a physically active act by virtue of the walk to and from the bus stop at either end. Notably, by the way, that seems to be from a couple of the studies, more beneficial to lower income residents who are more dependent on transit for routine travel. So not surprisingly, um, they get the benefit of the physical activity associated with it. Um, when we talk about, by the way, bicycling, not just walking, keep in mind there are a range of tools. Everybody assumes we mean, well, we need to build a bike lane everywhere or build multi-use trails. Well, no, indeed, on lower volume, low speed streets, uh, shared bike routes or share rows like the picture in the top right here are fully appropriate. And my only point is there are lots of technical solutions for different settings. So don't think that it's all urban or all rural or suburban. Indeed, when we were doing the workshop down in North Kingstown, this road back to Devil's um, uh, uh, Foot Road, what was notable is that's the kind of street where somebody might have said, oh, come on, nobody's going to walk on this road anyway. Why should we bother to build a sidewalk or a bike lane? So needless to say, when we're out there on their walk audit, what do we see but this young mom walking with two kids, one in a, the front carrier, one in the, in the stroller, trying to prevail prevail against absolutely horrifying conditions for a pedestrian right alongside really fast moving traffic. Um, and um, what we have to recognize is, well, the, one of the reasons we don't tend to see pedestrians there is because we've built places that are so challenging. Um, that's one of the reasons in the workshops that we do, we really like to get people out on the ground experiencing it 
So that this isn't just a hypothetical reality. We've seen it. Keep in mind here, low-income housing to the left, it's just outside of the picture, um, which is serving a large population who is, I think, underserved by the design of that roadway. Um, these may well be the people that could never afford a membership at a health club or a fitness center. Indeed, their, their best opportunity for walking might be walking to the nearby shopping that this woman is walking to, uh, but certainly not if we leave it this dangerous for them. The picture in the lower right, by the way, is the small structure they've made for all the kids that wait for the school bus there, serving that large development. Again, indicating lots of pedestrian activity if all those kids are walking to this bus stop. <coughs> Pardon me. The third element is site design. What happens when I get to my destination? And these two photos I could take anywhere in the United States against urban, urban, suburban, rural, the giant automobile-oriented sort of sprawl parking lot or the traditional downtown. And you don't need to be a land use planner or an architect to recognize those elements in the left-hand picture, which create a more friendly and indeed safe environment for bicyclists and pedestrians. It's things like the buildings being near the sidewalk and the parking being on street, buffering them from the traffic. Um, trees and benches and lighting that provides a sense of safety, but also comfort. And, and keep in mind, if we really are talking about all potential users, what we mean here is that my mom, who maybe wouldn't walk that whole distance without taking a break along the way, the benches and the, and the street trees provide her shade and an incentive to still take that walk because it's pleasant, inviting, and functional for her. Um, back to, to one of our Kingstown workshops, um, if you look very closely, I'm going to ask you to look for the endangered species, which of course are the pedestrians in these photos, on a road called Tower Hill Road, classic automobile-oriented development. And if you look closely, you can pick out a couple in the background there, trying to make their way against conditions designed entirely for the automobile. Again, coming from some low-income housing off of the side of the photo here, um, my point is this. When we design for the car, we leave behind what I call the invisible pedestrians, the people that often you drive by at 45 or 65 miles an hour and don't even recognize they're there as they're trying to make their way to shop, to a transit stop, to work, to take their kids to daycare or to school. Um, the good news is that our colleagues in engineering actually do know how to do a good job of designing this stuff. That the, the, we have elements, and this is our fourth element, safety. We, we know how to design places that work for bicyclists, pedestrians, motor vehicles, and transit. And these kinds of tools pictured here, roundabouts, mid-block crossings, uh, curb extensions, the picture in the lower right, are tools that, if we ask for them, engineers can put in place. The problem is, for the last 30 or 40 years, what we asked was for them to move traffic faster. So that's what we got, wider roads and more lanes. But in communities where coalitions like the ones we're talking about are asking for things like these, they're getting them. In other words, we're seeing these kinds of projects be done. So an example would be in Urbana, Illinois, where the road on the left, Philo Road, was a real traffic disaster. It caused a lot of collisions. Car would stop in the left lane to turn left. The car behind him would hit him or try to go around. So the traffic engineer, Jennifer Selby, decided, you know what, we're going to put to a road diet. That's what the term is, by, by the way, being used by engineers around the country, road diet. And they converted from four lanes to three. And you'll notice in the picture on the right, with one travel lane in each direction and a center turning lane, they've now got room for bike lanes. And that center turn lane, when there's no turning available for cars, can be turned into an island that protects pedestrians, that protects pedestrians as they cross. And the beauty of this is you're moving just as many cars just as well while you're making it much safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. So this road diet may not seem like a, a public health intervention, but I would argue if it reduces automobile collisions and makes it safer and more inviting for bicyclists and pedestrians, then it's, it's a win on every front in absolutely classic public health because it has a population level impact. Well, back to Kingstown where we did our workshop on, King, on Kingstown Road here, Tower Road. And if you take a look, it might take as little as paint to convert that four lane road to a two lane road with a center turning lane and bicycle lanes on either side. Now I'm not saying that's the actual design solution here. What I'm saying is one of our jobs is to help policymakers, local elected officials, or, and for that matter, the citizens that are out with us on that walk envision what the change could be and say, oh, we could do that here. Similarly, when we did a workshop, when the workshop, when our walk audit took us into downtown, we created a human curb extension, the, the picture in the top right, the bump out there to show how narrowing the street, bringing the sidewalk out would make it, make it much safer for an elderly pedestrian to cross there. And we even envisioned where in the picture in the lower right, a little small roundabout or mini circle might change traffic speeds as cars were entering town, or on the left, that's an elementary school on the right-hand side, and you see the pedestrian signal there, or the pedestrian sign, 
the problem is the traffic still blows by that school. But a small island like that with a sign like the uh, yield to pedestrian and crosswalk might make a huge difference, even some paint and a simple sign. And the point again, if we can get community members, this interdisciplinary coalition out there, and if the public works director can be standing next to a mayor as well as a parent and the local hospital administrator and somebody from the health department, and they can all stand there together and envision this, then everybody provides the political cover so that collectively we can decide to do stuff that otherwise we're afraid to take on alone. So the public works director might say, oh my gosh, if I try to do that, people will yell at me about slowing the traffic. Well, not if he's got the cover of all those other partners in that team. I do want to give a nod. There, I've talked a lot about the physical activity side of the equation, but we have to recognize there are a lot of very compelling tools now developing around nutrition. Um, we can't, I can't do justice to them in just one slide, but I want to suggest the power of them ranges from simple stuff like making sure we have a place for our farm market or maybe that our zoning ordinance allows for urban agriculture, backyard chickens, uh, beekeeping, uh, urban farming. Um, or let's go all the way and let's do what Los Angeles County has done and not just regulate where they allow fast food, but indeed put in place a moratorium on the development of any more fast food. So right now, you can't get a permit to build a McDonald's, a Chick-fil-A, a Taco Bell, any of that in L.A. County because they've decided from a public health standpoint, they've got plenty of those. The density of fast food restaurants is sufficiently high for their population and they don't need any more. That's when we're really talking about a socio-ecological change, right? When we, we begin to make that level of policy decision. So again, to recap, we're really talking about that mix of land uses, everything from neighborhood schools to shopping, the continuity of the network, a site design, safety features, and over an overlay of healthy and affordable food available to all. Um, those really characterize uh, those elements characterize, I, I would say, healthy community by design, or let's call it this. A, a community that is stickier for the healthier choice, stickier for healthier choices. So we ought to think about where does that go next? You know, what does it really take? Well, I made the case, and, and, and indeed I think you could say, how do we get there? Okay, let's say I accept this model. Um, I wrote an article in the, for the February issue of Childhood Obesity Magazine where I essentially laid out my argument for what the playbook is, if you will. What we're seeing used, um, much like we talked about a playbook for tobacco, secondhand smoke and public place smoking bans and a advertising bans. Well, around physical activity, I think these are the five things that we're seeing show great promise. Master planning and zoning ordinances that really encourage mixed use by, their, by, the, by the ordinance. Complete streets guidelines. Creating trail networks, not just for recreation, but for transportation. Trails that connect neighborhoods to schools, senior housing to shopping. Um, uh, there's an entire discipline called transportation demand management. It's essentially the infrastructure and incentives for more bicycle and transit use. And last but certainly not least, safe routes to school, where we really focus on building the school as a healthy community center. So I outline that in some detail in the February issue of Childhood Obesity, and I, I, I bring it to your attention. If, if this stuff interests you, it, 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 it would be a good starting point because there's a pretty extensive bibliography. Similarly, in the August issue of Childhood Obesity, um, uh, the First Lady's Let's Move campaign supported these two special issues. You see here she, she actually wrote a, 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 an editorial for the, for the February issue. And in the, in the August issue, they focused more on the nutrition side of the equation. And again, they talked about the high-level policies, not just encouraging people to eat more fruits and vegetables, not just giving out coupons for you know, veggies at the store, but literally changing our food systems so that we are getting um, the healthy choices uh, more available, more affordable to a much broader portion of the population. Which leads us to an interesting question. How do you get there? Let's say I buy all of this and I'm even ready to go. I'm the health department, I'm the local hospital, I'm the local uh, community health organization or, or maybe foundation. I, I don't build the roads, I don't write the zoning ordinance, what, what's the deal, how do I do this? We're seeing essentially these six things, and this is where HRI and AI and I have come together because we sort of have been doing this work and are seeing, I think, six themes reflect, be reflected in the successful community. So I just want to touch on each of these. It's about leadership, uh, having a focused list of action items and creating what we call action teams, not just standing committees, identifying staff support, um, having less frequent partnership meetings. In other words, it's not about meeting every month. It's much more about when you do get together, focusing on action and timelines and outcomes and really creating some kind of a jump start. 
So if you think about the kinds of things I've been talking about, this list doesn't even scratch the surface of all the people that you got to have in the room. You don't even have to read the list. You just have to know, oh, my God, it's every sort of standing committee, council, uh, board in my community, plus neighborhood associations. And if I tried to build an organizational chart, you might start with the health and the planning and the transportation folks, but pretty quick say I need public works and elected officials and the neighborhoods and the Heart Association and Diabetes and Cancer Society, Recreation Parks, Trails, YMCA, employers, insurance. I can't just do it all, right? And here's the real problem. If you try to convene all those people in the same place at the same time, I guarantee you, you will end up with a list of 100 action items because everybody will bring their pet project to the table and you will never make any kind of strategic decisions. So what we've seen in the communities that I think are getting the best traction and making a real good progress are more compact leadership teams. And I call them stealth leadership teams, not because they're sneaky, but because these are all people who are willing to give up any kind of notoriety or fame and, and just do the work behind the scenes to get it job done. So you'll see, I usually see about 10 people on the, on the core leadership team. They reflect a broad discipline, not just the health usual suspects. It's not just health department, hospital, YMCA, parks and rec. It goes way beyond that to the private development community, maybe the housing authority, transit. Three things really characterize the folks that populate the most successful teams. Number one, They've embraced the vision of policy and environmental change. They are not just talking about launching another walking program, another five-a-day fruit and vegetable program. They want to change policy. Number two, they can work on this as part of their job. Their portfolio allows them time to really try to influence the outcomes we're talking about. And number three, they are one phone call or email away from the larger group so that when you do need to convene the full partnership around the community, they are the kind of folks that will get, you, get people in the door. Now, this is important because those three criteria are a really good filter as you're building your team right now. They embrace the vision, they can spend time as part of their job, and they have the kind of community influence and reach to get all the partners in the room. This is a really good way to think about building your team, populating it, um, and, and making sure you've got the breadth to be successful. An example um, of the second piece here would come from Rapid City, South Dakota. What I talked about there was a short action list, a short list of action items. You know, when we did workshops out in, in Rapid City, by the way, the coldest walk audit I have ever done in my life. We were out there, and I had city councilors. I had members of the community come out with us, 14 degrees below. It was really cold. Um, and that said, um, rather than come up with a list of 30 ideas, they decided priority snow clearing on their trail, that's the Rapid Creek Trail in the picture on the left, saying we're going to maintain that and make sure that thing gets plowed in the winter because a lot of kids walk and bike to school along it in the winter more walk. But if we're not plowing it, those kids are going to be asking for a ride. And now those cars will be on the street and now we can't plow the roads. So we actually win by plowing our trail. But also they installed countdown timers at some of their key intersections. And one of the simplest things they did was simply a procedural change. Their city council had been in the habit of giving waivers to developers that wanted to build subdivisions and asked to not have to put in the sidewalks. And they said, well, okay, it's a rural subdivision, you have to put in the sidewalks. And we agreed that if they keep doing that, they'll never have a network of sidewalks there. That only if they begin chipping away, even if those sidewalks don't connect to anything, they've got to start putting them in. So that's one of their changes. And my point is, a small handful of changes, but that will really have a, make a difference in the community is more valuable than a big long list of wish list that's never actually acted upon. The third thing I talked about was creating action teams. Once you've created that wish list, I recommend and have seen communities successfully create teams to tackle the specific topics. So we don't have the entire partnership work on every topic. We get the folks that are really good with trails work on the trail system. And the folks that understand transit and transportation demand management, they do that. And the folks that really get food systems work on that. These action teams are not about monthly meetings and regular reporting. They're about going out and actually trying to get the job done. And the most effective ones have specific target timelines progress or benchmarks, and, and interestingly enough, many of them are even closed-ended. They said, we are going to work on a new complete streets ordinance. We're going to take 18 months and do it, and at the end of 18 months, once we've completed it successfully, we're done, we're going to disband or move on to another action team. So they, the, the reason that's important is it's much easier to get somebody to sign up for a finite, closed-ended objective that if once attained, they say, I can move on to the next thing, as opposed to yeah, we're going to be asking you to sit on this committee for the next five years with monthly meetings on Tuesday nights. You good with that? Mm -hmm. um, in general, I just don't see that being powerful or effective. 
So action teams, and of course, what happens is once these action teams are up and running, then you find the, the, the areas of sort of cross-disciplinary uh, work. For example, um, the group that's building the trail system starts to talk to the, group, uh, to the group that's worrying about kids walking and bicycling to school and can prioritize routes accordingly. Um, Fourth thing is this, the, the, the successful initiatives seem to have staffed themselves. In other words, they're not depending on a volunteer or a rotating sort of note taking and things like that, minute keeping. They said, look, it's going to be somebody's job to, to keep us on task, whether it's uh, agendas and things like that, creating and maintaining our action, action plans, checking on the benchmarks and progress and acting as a primary contact. And that can it be a lot of different ways. It can just be administrative staffing associated with the, the organization. It could be what Live Well Omaha did, which is actually got a number of partners to jointly fund a position called the Active Transportation Manager in Omaha, Nebraska. Now get a look at this. Residing in the planning department, there is now a person who thinks specifically about bicycle, pedestrian, and transit activity and making sure all projects include bike, pet, and transit accommodation. And that, in part, is paid for by Allegiant Health, their regional health care organization, and by the Regional Planning Authority, the MPO. What's striking is there's a classic public-private partnership there in coming together to, um, I think, ramp up a position that they're going to find it so valuable that the planning department will say, we can't let this go away. We need to maintain this over time. Quick side note here, the only really re real reason to convene the full partnership, I, I, I'm amazed the number of communities that try to have quarterly uh, meetings of 100, 150 people, the entire partnership. It's a lot of energy and effort and, and not especially productive from the standpoint of moving ahead your action items. Indeed, I think a, a, an annual or maybe semi-annual, twice a year at most, meeting where you come together, report on progress, look for synergies and even help, um, and seek out those confluence points. So again, trail in Boone County and Boone, North Carolina, that connects the school to their um, public park system, allows these kids to walk and bike from school to where their cross-country meter, their lacrosse game is after school. And, and the beauty of that is it eliminates a bus on the road while we're at it because we don't have to bus the team over there. And, you know, you need your trails partners and your schools and your public safety folks all working together to be comfortable and, and figure out how to do that. Last thought is that all you can do all of this and do it well and still say, my God, we are struggling. You know, I've gone to the public works department a half dozen times, or, or even more likely, we've gone to the elected officials, the planning commission or the city council or the school board, and we just can't make headway. Um, I get this all the time. I understand, and I think sometimes you need an outside push. And, and this is entirely self-serving with that handsome fellow in the photo there. Those of you who know me know that the guy with the mustache is actually me, leading a walk audit in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, and, uh, but, and, and, but my point is whether it's me or anybody else, sometimes an outside voice can really make a difference. And, and it can range from helping you assess where you are now to creating this interdisciplinary team, uh, and especially the leadership level folks, to really getting your focus drilled down on a handful of key interventions or ongoing technical support. Um, and I just talk about each of these very, very briefly. I, I have tended to see four or five elements, and when HRIA and I work together, we actually use this as sort of a, um, a roadmap because these seem to be the things that help a community get going. So I'd offer you to, this roadmap to look at. Think about first, what have you done around assessment? Have we, and that can range from like physical scouting, like the walk audits that we talk about, to a, to a full-fledged policy review. Um, and then who are we engaging? Are we doing workshops and, and reaching out for key informant interviews to our key stakeholders? Um, then drilling down to recommendations that get the big cheeses in the room. And, and you know, if, if the mayor and the city council don't hear this before you're done, then you're still not there. Because in the end, they're going to have to vote on policies that either do or don't support these kinds of changes. And that may, might, might mean creating documentation as well and perhaps even ongoing technical assistance. So everybody can agree that complete streets are important, but quite frankly, if the traffic engineers don't know how wide a bike lane has to be, then, then we need some technical assistance. So um, let me just talk about each of these very briefly. I, I think that the, the walk audits are a great example, but not the only example of a way to do a community assessment. Here you see a picture on the top right where we formed a human curb extension. And unfortunately, we lost the guy on the corduroy coat on the outside there, but it was a very good learning experience. No, no, I'm kidding, of course. Um, and, and, and what we did do, though, was make everybody realize how dramatically different that intersection could be by standing there and really feeling what the speeding traffic felt like and what it could do. 
So I think these walk audits can be educational, but they can also be very inspirational and a great opportunity to develop public involvement. We often come straight from the walk audit, in, in audit indoors to a planning session. Um, regarding engagement, I'm going to remind you that it's everybody and anybody, and really the only the, the key bullets on here. You know, the top bullet, you'd all say, right, right, we needed school administration and we need public works and the police. Um, what we often leave out of the last two bullets, the private sector, the business community, um, developers, landowners, those are the folks that build a huge amount of the built environment. I have been blown away by what they contribute. If we can get them in the room to sit down after the walk audit for the planning session that you see pictured here, they can add so much to the discussion because they understand the economics of it. Um, in a workshop, we often have um, several elements. And, and, and a workshop could be two hours one afternoon. It could be a week long that we do a series of activities. And it could be over six months, as we did when we were developing uh, the master plan, the pedestrian master plan in um, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So the range can be bright, broad, but it tends to involve these five parts, the envisioning of the future for the community, learning about the tools that are available, you know, those images of roundabouts and crosswalks and things, showing that this is in the realm of the possible, going out and doing the walk, coming back in and doing the planning, and committing to next steps. Um, that those are typical elements of a workshop. And one thing we remind people, you will often find, if you only have the usual suspects in the room, you'll only want to do the first P, the programs. We're going to talk about let's launch a walking program and let's get out. Some, we'll do a big event. We'll have a walk to school day and a walk to bike or a bike to work week. Those things, remember, suffer the stickiness problem. Only when we start to change the physical infrastructure with projects and change the policies do you really get the long-term permanent change. And we can report that back. You can report that back to your key stakeholders lots of ways. I love to see a combination of doing it in person plus a follow-up written document. In person, we love to do things like leadership breakfast. You'll find if you promise they can get out the door by about 9.30 or 10 in the morning, you can get elected officials to come to a session. We did you know, uh, that very effectively in North and South Kingstown where because we promised them a brief and concise summary of the recommendations, we got city council members, school board members, planning commissioners, uh, department heads from planning, public works. It really makes a huge difference. But it's better still to hand them a document. And, and let me make a recommendation there. If you were going to put out an RFP to have some planning done, somebody develop, for example, a bicycle and pedestrian plan for a community, a trails plan, a, a safe routes to school plan, make sure that you ask for less of the background content, the demographics, the current conditions, um, all that kind of stuff, and ask for more focus on the concrete action items. Again, those communities that have in their hand concrete, doable actions with predictable timelines and even recommended resources. Here's how you would fund this. Here's a grant that you can apply for that might get that sidewalk bill, that might get that trail updated. Um, those are the most beneficial things. So make a real focus on, on concrete action items um, as opposed to the broader sort of platitudes about uh, um, how we're going to build a healthier community. Uh, and that may seem like a mundane thing, but I'm shocked at the, at the number of plans that get handed out and then are still an inch and a half thick and sit on a, on a shelf somewhere. That's why I like about a 10-page a feedback report like the one we did here for North and South Kingstown because those 10 pages, man, anybody can read. The, the traffic engineer's got his stuff, but so does the mom who came on the walk audit with us and was concerned about her kids being able to walk safely. She saw specific recommendations about sidewalks near the elementary school, and she said, okay, I get this. And, and I think you've got to get that practical, if I, if I may be so bold. I also mentioned in, in a final point uh, that, that even all of this is only the beginning of the end, right? It, or really, it's the end of the beginning, because now you're going to go out and actually do the work, right? And so you may well need ongoing technical assistance, and there are lots of great places providing that. This is just a short list of some of my favorites. And if you go to our websites, either HRIA or mine, markfrenton.com, you'd see links to others. But let me just say the National Safe Routes to School Initiatives, uh, the Complete Streets Initiative, Active Living Research, which is the one that's maintained through funding of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation out at UC San Diego, um, the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center down at University of North Carolina, uh, and the Centers for Disease Control. Those five or six are really good starting place. If, if you were to read my article in the, in the Childhood Obesity Magazine uh, journal, you would most of the technical support, you know, kind of beefy content that you need you could find your way to through these websites. So this is a good resource list. Um, that said, uh, lots of folks still are going to need a little bit of hand-holding, and I think that's when you reach out to live partners and, and bring them into for that jump start that I was talking about. And for those of you who know me, you know how I'm going to conclude. 
you know I'm going to say that I recognize that I'm a froth at the mouth lunatic about this stuff. That I, you know, to, to most of you are thinking the guy breathed only three times during this entire talk. How does he do that? Um, and I am, and I acknowledge that, and I am absolutely passionate about this. And you know the reason why. It's frankly not for any of you, who, many of whom I know. I saw the sign-up list. I, you're wonderful people. You're doing great work. But I'm not doing this for you. And quite frankly, I'm not doing it for myself, for my friend Steve here. Um, we're doing it for our kids. Those are my son and daughter and um, who are now 14 and 17. But as I often tell people, I've frozen them in time at 3 and 5 because they were so very cute then. And also... Um, because um, they're part of the first generation in modern American society that's going to end up with shorter life expectancies than their parents. And it's not because of Ebola, HIV, AIDS, um, uh, um, avian flu. It's because of the diseases of sedentary living and poor nutrition. That's what's going to drive down life expectancy for that generation. And here's the striking thing. We can urge and cajole and beg people to exercise more and eat better all we want. That's not going to save this generation. The only thing that's going to do it is if we embark on community-level change like what we've just talked about. And it's not easy. It's hard. It requires the level of work that we've just discussed here. However, I have great faith we can do it because I'm seeing communities all over the country do it. I'm seeing health departments step up to the plate. So um, please, please, please be a part of that solution. Raise the bar on your work. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. And I look forward, I hope, to, to working with lots of you a lot more in the future. Thanks very much. Mark, thank you very much for your passion and your commitment to this work. As you can see, Mark is very energetic for those of you who may not have had the chance to work from, uh, with him. I know I'm out of breath after this last 40 minutes. <laughs> So uh, thank you. As a reminder to folks, um, we will get these slides out to you in a follow-up email in the next few hours uh, with an evaluation piece. They'll also be available at our website.